This video is brought to you by Coding Dojo. My friends, the GOAT, not Cristiano Ronaldo, Messi. My friends, the real GOAT. Thank you. Okay, so I brought a couple of developers so they can help me out review the MacBook Pro 14 inch for programmers. And honestly, they give us some really nice insights on how Apple silicone, silicone? So, silicone or silicon? I feel like someone's gonna talk to me in the comments, make me look good, all right? Yeah, I think this video is going to be a good, like well-rounded video about programmers with these laptops. I really suggest you guys like, Check it out. I'm gonna leave some timestamps so you guys don't have to like watch the whole video if you want to get into the nitty gritty of things. And yeah, let me know down below if you guys uh, enjoy the video. Okay, so disclaimer: I spent four years of my life studying software engineering and computer science. I know my way around code pretty well, actually quite well. I had some clients during university, did a few jobs with friends, and tried to build a web agency until I fell in love with creating tech-related content. But look. After a year of owning this, if I had to pick a laptop for programming that would last me for years to come, it would be this one. As much as I love the Air and I think that's the best laptop to get started as a developer and someone that might want to taste a bit of mobile development, AI, and just simply have little to no limitations, the 14 inch MacBook Pro is it. Let me explain why. My biggest pet peeve when it comes to coding is screen real estate. Basically, it's the amount of space available for an application to provide output. And when I code, I need space. Apple built this chassis to provide all the tools you need to get professional work done with three Thunderbolt 4 ports, an HDMI output, an audio jack, an SD card reader, and MagSafe 3. The usability this provides is amazing. In short, with a base model, you can connect up to two external displays to your Mac using one Thunderbolt 4 port and the HDMI port. And if you do get the M1 Max, you can connect up to three displays at up to 6K over USB-C and the other one up to 4K with HDMI 2.0. Yeah, I know, HDMI 2.0, but it really isn't that big of a deal for development. As much as 2.1 allows for high resolutions at higher frame rates, it really hasn't affected my development experience even in the slightest bit. The important thing to note is that you can rock at least two monitors without a dongle and not be limited to a single ultra wide at best. I think it's a massive win for a developer, especially when we all know how hard it is to be demoing a project on an ultra wide. It's a pain in the, you know what? For those who build lots of responsive UIs, you all know what I'm talking about. I'm also happy with the fact that the 14 inch MacBook Pro is the perfect size when it comes to portability. As much as we all like having more screen real estate when it comes to carrying a laptop around, it's a pain to do so with the 16 inch. Those are way too big, way too bulky. It's almost doesn't make sense in my opinion. Carrying this 3.5 pound laptop everywhere is much more doable. I usually just throw them into my moth sleeves and away I go. This little setup I've got going on here fits in my backpacks, my Notion bag. I often throw it in the passenger seat. It's literally the perfect size for anything, especially when you go on a plane and try to code on those tray tables, which was already insanely hard with my 15 inch MacBook. Look, this 14 inch display is plenty to get some work done and it's good enough to prioritize portability. The fact that a year later, we've got most applications now supporting the new Nodge API and taking advantage of all the new extra space is also reassuring. In fact, look, these are my current VS Code settings and when I open code on my machine and maximize the window, this is how much room my lines take horizontally. If I was to compare that with my 32 4K monitor at the office, it really isn't that bad for a laptop in my opinion. Now, I will say this screen really flourishes when it comes to the quality of the display. However, it's not perfect. I used to be obsessed with CSS and SCSS and making my Shopify themes look sick. And when I was doing that back in the day, I was more often following designs. When it comes to UI and UX work, the display is still amazing for it. I love matching my colors, getting great contrast ratios, color output, having a DCI-P3 of 99%, it's already nice for most work. Where it falls a little short is in that Adobe RGB coverage. It's often preferred by those who work in digital arts and have more intricate color management needs. Note that Adobe RGB does lean towards more blues and greens, whereas 
DCI-P3 goes into yellows and red. This liquid retina XDR panel is not perfect, but I do enjoy how awesome ProMotion is, especially when I'm coding on Xcode and I'm just going around the design board. As a whole, after being on this display for about a year, I think it's a solid screen with peak brightness of 1600 nits with HDR content and 500 nits in normal SDR mode. I can say that coding inside or outside or in any environment has been great. Just know that this mini LED panel can be annoying at times because of its glare. And so powering this thing up, let me start by saying that this ARM processor with this 70 watt hour lithium polymer battery really deliver. Battery is so good and it completely annihilates my old 15 inch MacBook Pro. That thing died so quick, especially when I was learning iOS development back in the day, Xcode would just eat it up. I will say it's really rare that I'm doing Xcode work and I'm not on a larger display, but when setting up servers, coding on Node, and even doing some Python work like I was doing not long ago, I can get about eight hours of work done, which is enough for me to not even have to think about battery life. In fact, it's enough for me to not even have to think about bringing my MagSafe charger. Don't get me wrong, MagSafe is so nice. It's actually something I really wish I had back in the day when I was in uni. I think it's the perfect dummy proof MacBook destroyer prevention feature. You have no idea how many times I've seen people stepping on charging cords when walking in the cafeteria or walking by the hallways in class. Yeah pretty scary. MagSafe is definitely a nice feature for pretty much anyone, but I think especially for engineering students. Another feature I very much like is this keyboard. I will say I'm used to typing on mechanical keyboards, but for some odd reason, going back and forth between this and my mode keyboard really doesn't feel like I have to adapt that much. I also absolutely love how awesome the keys sound because of this black anodized aluminum inset. I like the travel the keys have, how big and chunky they feel, I've got no issues with its layout or anything like that. It doesn't make my semicolons or parentheses or even brackets life a living hell. Anyways, we even use this semicolons nowadays. Within the year, I've owned this and have been writing code with it. This is exactly how this keyboard has been aging and I have absolutely no complaints. Although I will admit it can get quite greasy. Now, all of this is nice. It seems like it's all a fairy tale, but ARM for programming is not perfect. In fact, it's far from perfect. Look, have you guys ever heard of DoesItArm.com? DoesItArm.com will very much give you a list of what ARM can run and what it cannot run. For myself and for many of us, most tools are very much already supported by ARM. In fact, if I do a quick check on my activity monitor, you will indeed see that. But when it comes to niche work and certain types of workflows, it's a pain. For example, Android Studio emulators are a pain to run. You always need to install things a certain way, install the proper emulator, and even at that, sometimes it doesn't run. As much as Parallels is great and you can use Windows 11 the ARM to code.net projects and use Visual Studio, Visual Studio is not easy to install and for ARM, it doesn't cover all the workflows you might need. Not only that, but if you pair things with Docker because Docker uses QEMU to emulate a lot of .NET runtimes, this causes bugs. Honestly, some Reddit users just state that it's a ball ache getting Docker images to work properly or Python packages to work properly. You always end up scouring on forums to try and figure out how to troubleshoot and whatnot. To me, it feels like everything that's not supported needs a trick. You need some extra steps or workarounds to get things rolling. And as a developer, I hate the fact I can't get started on work because I'm troubleshooting how to get things started. So I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like everything's perfect because it's not, especially if you deal with PyTorch libraries that require CUDA to run and NVIDIA graphics to be used. However, to tell you the full story, one of my friends that works at Expedia has a 16 inch Intel based laptop on loan from them. It is his main laptop for work, but apparently new hires get M1 MacBooks and can integrate without issues. We are talking about Expedia here, so a massive company. I even went to the extent of asking Yazzie, who's been working at Twilio for a while now, and again, 
zero issues on his end for the type of web development work he does. What's up everyone, Jossie here. So I've been a software engineer for the past four years, but I also was a computer science major. So I've been coding since I was 18 and I'm 27. And if I do the math, nine years of programming. Over the course of my nine years of programming, I've mainly used MacBooks, whether it was a MacBook Pro 13 inch, like the 20, 12 model that took me three years through college and then senior year i use the intel i5 chip i can't believe i'm even saying that macbook air it just barely got me through senior year the m1 macbook pros have more than enough power to do front-end development full stack or back-end development when coding and designing you mostly use chrome and an integrated dev environment and those apps don't require much computing power compiling time is where the computing power is needed to perform so if you plan on using a laptop for enterprise development or working collaboratively through version control and you find yourself building and compiling thousands of packages files and folders i definitely think the base model 14 inch and 16 inch M1 Pro MacBook Pros are powerful enough to get the job done. From a purely development standpoint, whether you're in a coding boot camp, you're a university student studying computer science or software engineering, or you're a professional software engineer, I can't think of a better laptop than the 14 inch or 16 inch M1 Pro. And what separates this laptop from its competitors is that ProRes XDR display, which looks so good, which is probably my favorite feature when it comes to this laptop when using it on a go. So that's sort of my high level view of the 14 inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro. Back to you, Andreas. Also, one of the best ways for you guys to get your foot in the door within these companies is by doing a bootcamp. A bootcamp, if taken seriously, is one of the best ways to acquire a lot of the qualities that make a good engineer and developer. Coding Dojo is actually there to help you start your new career in tech in a matter of weeks. I personally attended their online coding bootcamp. I was given a schedule for the day and followed as I went through the classes. We did a bit of algorithms, which reminded me very much of university, except for this time, things were so much more interactive and I found people to be a lot more interested. Group activities were organized within our Zoom calls. We used Replit to make sure we were able to collaborate on code. And the instructor was extremely good at explaining topics and explaining the principles of algorithms. I honestly very much enjoyed attending this day of class for the second time. Coding Dojo is also part of Colorado's Technical University. As a whole, they have a well-rounded curriculum where you will learn Python, JavaScript, Java, .NET, and much more. You'll also have access to a bunch of resources, teachers, interactive activities, depending on what type of program you pick. Whether you decide to go into software development, data science, or cybersecurity, I invite you guys to check their coding boot camps and learn to code in a matter of weeks. I'll leave some links down below. Now, I don't want to make it seem like this laptop is not it for developers because it's not entirely true. I'm just here to trying to provide you guys with a full picture. After a year of ownership from multiple people, these are the negative comments we often hear from developers within forums and whatnot. Personally, with the type of work I do, it's a beast of a machine. I am a JavaScript advocate. I love Node.js, love connecting it to my Xcode apps. I love trying new things like Python and Django, love doing web development for custom themes on Shopify. Frameworks like React are absolutely amazing to me. It really is a great laptop for mobile developers, web developers, most data science people. It's a beast. Even Joe Knows Best, who handles a lot of dev work on the day-to-day, -day, has very much been enjoying his experience with it. From dealing with back-end Node.js Python projects to a lot of React work, as well as iOS development, he really seems to be enjoying his M1 Max to the fullest. What's going on? So a lot of you guys don't know this, but when I'm not being a car YouTuber, I'm actually a software developer. I've been doing this professionally for about 10 years. I opened my own software company about five years ago. Uh, we manage 50 Shopify stores, probably six or seven enterprise level APIs, uh, a plethora of React and Angular apps, and probably like four or five iOS apps that are currently on the App Store. My point being, I've been doing this a very long time, and I was probably one of the first devs to adopt Apple Silicon when the first MacBook Pro 13 inch came out. Uh, and it was an absolute nightmare. You'd use Rosetta and emulators and Docker wouldn't run. You couldn't get Node to install. You'd run two terminals side by side. One. 
it wasn't fun. And it wasn't until about six months after that uh, and two OS updates that I did switch back to Apple Silicon. I have not looked back since. This is my fourth Apple Silicon laptop. These devices are absolutely phenomenal for developers. Typically when a giant architecture change like this happens, you're years away from having a fully functional ecosystem. However, unlike Windows ARM that failed miserably, Apple gave developers a valid reason to redevelop their apps to run natively on this chip. And that reason is performance. We're not talking about one, two, three times performance boosts. We're talking about magnitudes of 100. I have Xcode projects that went from a minute and a half to 10 second builds. I have Webpack bundles that went from 50 seconds to one second or even real time. And if you're a front-end developer and you do any kind of media creation, you know that things like Photoshop and Illustrator and Figma and XD and DaVinci Resolve and Final Cut, not Premiere, run exponentially faster on this chip. Uh, everything is blazingly fast, never gets hot, the fans never kick on, and you can realistically get 16 to 20 hours of battery life out of the 16 inch model. It doesn't matter if you're plugged into the wall or on battery power, the performance level stays about the same. Unlike its Windows competitors that when they're unplugged from the wall, you have about 30 minutes before it turns into an overheating pile of trash. It's probably no surprise that I'm gonna highly recommend if you're a developer to look into Apple Silicon. I don't think there's any reason you shouldn't unless you're natively a Windows developer or you're a game developer. Um, this probably isn't the platform for you guys. However, if you're in that category, you're probably not looking at this thing anyways. The last thing I'm gonna leave you with is the M1 Max is absolutely overkill for anything outside of like 8K and 4K video editing. Unless you're someone that just has to have the best of the best, save yourself the money, get a base model 14 inch or even an M2 Air and spend the savings on a monitor and a desk setup or something like that. It'll be uh, money better spent. And with that, back to you, Andreas. I also asked the boys within Joe's programming Discord chat and they gave us some nice freaking feedback on how they've been liking their MacBook Pros. I'll make a Google Drive and I'll drop the images right there so you guys can check them out. As a whole, I, honestly, it's such an amazing laptop. I think the only RAM issues I've had was when running way too many emulators at the same time, especially when I was playing with Flutter and deploying my app on iOS or Android emulators. Other than that, 16 gigabytes within macOS and Apple Silicon is very much well optimized and resources are well distributed. I want you guys to really think about your purchase. I think it's an amazing laptop for developers, almost perfect, but it's slightly not. After a year of multiple people owning this and see how this chip has been maturing, there's still some work that needs to be done. Two years is still a relatively short period amount of time for a chip to mature, especially when a lot of people rely on open source libraries to get their projects up and running. However, I think Apple is very close to making this laptop the only laptop you need for your development needs, for everyone of course. Let me know down below how your experience has been with your MacBook, especially as a developer. I think this video will very much help you guys on making that purchase decision. I'm signing out for today guys, take care. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> so oh my funny. god. See you guys soon. Oh, I'll see you all. <laughs>